So uh, if you look at the timeline, the colors don't mean anything other than they're, they're separating every hundred years as it goes through. And over here in yellow is the 70 year Babylonian captivity. And if you go, so the way, the way, the way this works is you have way, way over here on, on this side, you have David and then Solomon. And then you remember what happened after Solomon is the people wanted, uh, the, or, or continued, the people want, they had a king, right? They always wanted a king. And so at Solomon, the 12 tribes of Israel split. Ten tribes in the north. And what, what, that were called in the scriptures are called Israel, and then two tribes in the south, which is Judah and Benjamin, and they're known as Judah. And so, what you see here is you see each of the kings of of Israel and each of the kings of Judah, and then in the middle here are all the prophets. And so, you, it helps show where the prophets fall out in line. So, if you come over here just before the Babylonian captivity, or sorry, up on the top, you'll see the northern ten northern tribes. They come to an end right here. That's when the Assyrians came in, took over the ten northern tribes of Israel, scattered their people, and they never came back together. Now, on the and down here in Judah, that you see the kingdom of Judah continued on until they finally went into the Babylonian captivity. But we remember because we studied right Ezra and Nehemiah in the past couple of years. And what is after the Babylonian captivity, that's when Ezra led the first group back to Jerusalem. And then Nehemiah led another group back to Jerusalem. And they reformed and rebuilt the temple. That's, that's way over here on this side. So where we are right now is, you'll see right here, King Josiah. And then if you go right up above Josiah, you'll see the prophets there. And that is, you'll, you'll see um, Jeremiah, and you'll see this, this little bitty dot here is Zephaniah. And so Zephaniah uh, prophesied during the reign of Josiah. And does anybody remember anything interesting about King Josiah? King Josiah, so let's 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 get the timelines down. Okay, so King Josiah was he well, prophesied during his reign, yeah. What's that? He was kind of like a prophet king. He prophesied during his reign. So Josiah reigned from 640 to about 609 BC. Alright. And I, I, I apologize in advance. Is Richard in here? Yeah, Richard's a history geek like me, so he'll eat this stuff up. But I'm going to try to make it so it's not quite as boring for the rest of y'all. So, Josiah reigned from 640 to 609 B.C. And after his reign, very shortly thereafter, you'll see there were a couple little guys in the middle. But right, right at the end of Josiah's reign is when Nebuchadnezzar came in and the Babylonians took over Israel, or took over Judah. They, they, they captured Jerusalem. They destroyed the city. That's when Daniel and all those folks got taken into captivity for 70 years in Babylon. Now, if we look at the prophet Zephaniah, he likely, if we put the numbers together, he clearly says he's in the time of Josiah. But Zephaniah was a prophet in rough, roughly 635 to 625 B.C. And you say, well, why do we need all these numbers? Well, I think we do because you got to see what's going on. And so as you read, and remember, 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles are mirror books of each other. So it would be like saying that, um, uh, it would be like saying, if you took me, and I've been at this church about uh, 15, 18 years, somewhere in there, and you took Jeff, and you asked Jeff and I to, to talk about what's gone on in the church for the past five years, right? So everything Jeff would say would be accurate, everything I would say would be accurate, but we might pick up on little different points as we go through. That's how you have to look at First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. Same story told from a little bit different perspective, right? It's, it's easy. In other words, you can look at it, there's a football game on today. If you, if, you, if you watch the Super Bowl today and you ask tomorrow about the Super Bowl, if I ask Kevin, he might say, oh, I remember this one play, but then you ask Jason, he says, I remember a different play. But they both saw the same game. Right? So that's how you look at Kings and Chronicles together. So we're going to run through some, a fair amount of history in 2 Kings 22, chapters 22 and chapters 23 today. But what, is, what, what we want to do is we just want to set the background up for what's happening. So as you read through Kings and Chronicles, you'll read about the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. And it's interesting, every time you come to a new king, it will say like this. It will say, and then Manasseh was appointed king, and he reigned for 40 years, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. 
And you get another king and say, well, he reigned for five years and he did good in the sight of the Lord. Most of them did evil in the sight of the Lord. That's why God brought punishment upon the northern kingdom and ultimately the southern kingdom because the people had fallen away from him. And we're going to read some things today about the people and it's going to blow your mind at how bad they were. And the thing is, we got to look at them and then turn that mirror around into our own faces and say, wow, if they could fall that far, so can we. We always have to be careful. And it was so cool as I started to study through the book of Zephaniah um, and realized so many of the problems that were going on, why God sent Zephaniah. And then I look around at where we are in the idolatry, and it hit me last week, we closed 1 John with chapter 5, verse 21. If you remember, as we read through the book of John, he's going through all these ideas about how you can know you're saved, know that you've got a foundation of salvation, and how you can look at false teachers and tell that they're false. And it's a great book, right? We studied it for seven months, and then you get all the way to the very end of the book. Verse 21 just wings it out of nowhere. What's it say? It says, little children, guard yourselves from idols. And we talked about that doesn't seem to fit, did it? But I think it does because why did God send the prophet Zephaniah? Because of the idolatry of the people. And so when we look at idols ourselves, and what we're going to see here is we're going to see when, when the people were so focused on their idols and they took their focus off of God, what happened was, I don't mean this disrespectfully, the jealousy meter on God started going up. And when it got up to a certain level, he looked down and he said, I'm done. I'm done with you. I will destroy everything. And Josiah is going to do his best to turn the tide back. But it doesn't work. And so we have to look at, are you saved? Yes. If you are, then yes, you're saved. You're going to heaven. Your eternity is set. But there's that great saying, choose to sin, choose to suffer. If we continue to fall and, and, and bow down to idols, God will take His hands off of us. Doesn't mean we will lose our salvation, but we will become ineffective for the kingdom. And right now, what God needs is effective members of the kingdom. People seeking Him doing what He's called them to do and casting aside their idols. Chapter 2, verse 3, is a key point in the book of Zephaniah. And I'll read it to you real quick. Interesting. Think about, as I read the 3a, actually, just, I just want to read the first part, not the second sentence. Um, but think about this idolatry as you read this. Seek the Lord. All you humble of the earth, who have carried out His ordinances, seek righteousness, seek humility. That's the opposite of seeking idolatry. So, we, what we looked at last week was this idea of idols. And so, what is an idol? In the most basic sense, it's anything that takes its rightful place of God in your life. Anything. Right. So, Paul equated covetousness and greed with idolatry. Right? And what we see is different things today that can be idols for us in, in the Western world. Our careers, our pursuit of money, our pursuit of possessions, our pursuit of leisure and recreation, our pursuit of family. Families can become idols. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Secondary to loving God. Secondary. We see around us all around today where families allow their children to be the idols. Everything revolves around the children. That's right. It's supposed to revolve around God. Okay? Anything that puts a, a anything that puts a, a wedge between your relationship with God is an idol. All those uh, uh, and, and the root of all idolatry, the root of it is simple. It's self. It's all about me. See, when I seek to please me more than seeking to please Him, 
then whatever I'm seeking to achieve that pleasure with becomes an idol in my life. So what does John say? John, I mean, he's, he doesn't say this. It's not a, in, in 521, he's not beating us up. Listen to how he says it. Little children. Look, so he's looking at us like, oh, man, I want to train you up. Guard yourself from idols. Guard yourself. That means they're out there, they're coming after you, and they're easy because human, we fall for idols all the time. John's saying if you know the true God and His Son Christ, you have a treasure. Guard that treasure, which is that He is first and foremost in your life. So, to understand the wickedness of idolatry, we have to understand the jealousy of God. So, in this book of Zephaniah, there's a common theme that's called the Day of the Lord. It's, it's mentioned many, many times. The Day of the Lord. And it's also, it's going to be the day the Lord brings the wrath. He's going to bring a wrath upon that. Um, so, if you look at God's love, the backside of God's love is God's wrath. Right? Because we know that He is a God of wrath. He's going to send people to hell. He's going to bind the devil and put him in hell. That's wrath. And it is a book, this book is a book about the burning jealousy of God. And if you go back to Deuteronomy, God says, I am a jealous God. He says, I am a jealous God. I don't want any idols above me. I don't want any glory to go to anything, any person but me. All glory goes to Him. The Bible frequently says that God is a jealous God. But it's not jealousy like we think of where like uh, you're suspicious all the time and looking for violations of a relationship. It's not that. It simply means that God loves so thoroughly, so completely that He cannot tolerate a, a rival to His love. So when we look at jealous or jealousy, right? It is a rival to God's love. Because what God says, paraphrasing here, is that He says, I love you so much I sent my Son to the cross to save you. Which is to redeem you. To redeem you back to Himself. Is what He's saying. You're separated from Me. I made this sacrifice so that I could have you back to Me. Therefore, your first love should be the one who redeemed you. So, when we fall for idols... What we're doing is we're saying this idol is a, is a rival to God's love for me. And God looks down and says, how could that be? What could that thing or person or dollar bill or whatever it is, how, what has that done for you that I haven't done for you? Idolatry. God will destroy anything which hurts His loved one. That's why he sometimes is so ruthless with us. Anything that does that. And I forgot a piece of paper that I meant to bring. Every once in a while, the brain fails. And all morning I've been thinking, you know, there's something I'm missing, there's something I'm missing, there's something I'm missing. Maybe I stuck it in the back of this. I did not. in my printer. Oh well. That will be a nugget for next week. Okay. So the idea of, of, of idolatry. What it is, is, and, and let me, I, I read this great comment about idolatry. And it says, when God sees us loving and clinging to things which are damaging and hurting us, His jealousy comes in and says, no, you can't have that. When He sees us loving and and clinging to things that are damaging and hurt us. And we plead with Him and say, Lord, let me keep it. Let me keep it. And He says, no. I need you to give it up. Zephaniah is a great prophet of God's jealousy through judgment to blessing. And that's where we're going to look. So the book is broken down, and we'll really dive into the details of the book next week, is the for, for, for 1, 1 through 2, 3 is looking within. And he calls on, and, and you've got to think about that. When we fall for the idolatry of, in life, what, what gets us out of that, per se? 
The first thing is self-reflection. We have to look within and say, is my heart really sold out for God or is my heart clinging to something else that I think can bring me peace and joy and happiness, whatever, however you want to describe it. And then, what in, in the middle part of the book, he's going to say, look around. And what, in essence, what he's going to do is go look around. He's going to say, see all these people around you that all have these idols which are not God? I'm going to destroy them. And then, he says, look beyond, because at the end, which is going to go into captivity, but at the end of 70 years, I'm going to bring you back. In other words, to be a remnant that will be saved. And so as we look around today at ourselves is, are we the remnant that has been saved? So, um, let's go to 2 Kings chapters 22 and 23. And what we're going to do is, we're just it's going to take a while to get through, but we're going to kind of lay out what's going on in the kingdom. And why God's jealousy is burning so hot and why he sends the prophet Zephaniah, which he wasn't the only one. Zephaniah was a contemporary of Jeremiah and of Habakkuk. And God was predicting that things were going to fail. And so much so that he's looking at Judah and saying, haven't you even seen what happened to the northern kingdoms, to Israel? I destroyed them through the Assyrians. And they're, they're not coming back. But yet, you know, so it's like us seeing someone sin, a believer, okay? This, I'm talking to believers today. So it's like seeing a believer. Do you know it? Have you known anybody who is a born again believer that has gone off the rails? Have you seen it? Right? Could it happen to us? Definitely. Absolutely it could. So what, John, what, what God says through Zephaniah and through so many others is He's saying, look, don't you see what happened to the ten northern tribes, your brothers? In Christ, who went south because of idolatry, turn from your wicked ways. Turn from your idolatry. And he says it again. He says prophet after prophet. So when you study the prophets, major and minor, it gets repetitive because they keep saying the same thing. Turn back to God. Give up your sin. Give up your idolatry and turn back to God. And the people get stubborn. And so we're going to learn some lessons today about how bad things can get when we don't pay attention. And I think there's a group think that goes along with it as well. Because clearly, as I read into the story, not read the story, but I read into the story, how did people go south so, I will say quickly, but so far south so quickly? No accountability. No accountability. Can I just say that sure. the reason they put up all the idols was because they were being lazy and they didn't want to go down to Jerusalem where God told them to go to the, to the altar. And they want to put up altars on all corners and everything and buildings and statues everywhere. It's just they did. selfish laziness. Well, sure, some of it's selfish laziness, but there's no accountability. Right. There's no accountability. We need to be accountable to each other. It's what it is. It's why Scripture says, confess your sins to one another. It's not to stand up and confess all your sins like that. It's not what that means. What it means, the context of what it means is, build relationships strong enough that you can confess your sin because number one, it gets the weight off of you, right? If you go to somebody and you've built a relationship, and so how do we build relationships? Doing what we're doing here. Doing what we were doing yesterday. Doing what we do on Wednesdays. You build relationships with people. You build friendships Good, and that's right. Remember what the uh, we studied in First John again and again and again. Love of the brethren. It's a calling card of salvation. Do you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? If you do, you build relationships with them. And then if you really do, you'll hold them accountable. It's just the way it is. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes to be held accountable. But the reality is we all need it. That's why Christianity, even though salvation is individual, Christianity is a team sport. It's, it's, it's meant to go through. We're meant to go through this as a family together. Amen? That's what we do. So, give me, let me give you some background. And if you, if you go back to the, to the sketch, so you've got all these kings down here of Judah. And if you go back and you start reading through, you start at 1 Kings or 1 Chronicles and read through about them. And it gives a little history of each one of them. Tells you generally who their mother was. 
how long they reigned, and if they did evil or good inside the Lord. Most of them did evil. So in Judah, what we have is we got this king named Manasseh. And Manasseh was Josiah's grandfather. And Manasseh reigned for 40 years. Pretty long reign for a king. And again, he, this, is, this, is, this is in the kingdom of Judah, which is the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. Um, which is interesting, that's where Joshua and Caleb came out of. And that's where Jesus came out of. Right? The Lion of Judah, as Jesus is called. So that's why when you see at the end of the Babylonian captivity, Judah had to come back in, formed back together to build the temple because you had to have the Lion of David to go through still. So Manasseh was a bad guy and did a lot of bad things. We're going to read about, we're going to hear about how his grandson cleaned up some of the mess that he made. And then Manasseh had a son named Amon. And he became king when the old man died. And he was only a king for two years, but here's what you go. So if you go to 2 Chronicles 21, and here's, uh, let me just read about these two guys real quick. So King Manasseh, 21.1, says Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years, sorry, I thought it was 40, 55 years, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, imitating the detestable practices of the nations that the Lord had disposed of before the Israelites. So in other words, God's saying, these people do wrong. And so I'm going to get rid of them. And they go, oh, we really like what they do wrong, so we're going to do what they do. See the analogy where it comes to us today? Are we living just like the rest of the world? Because that's what they were doing. So if you went to Israel, Judah, in, call it, 700 B.C., and you went, to, you went, you went there, uh, Manasseh would be king. And if you went to Israel, and then you went to over here to Moab, and then you went over here to uh, Philistia, where the Philistines were, guess what would happen if you walked through all their cities and spent, go spend a week in each place? You wouldn't see any difference. You wouldn't see any difference. The Jews just looked look just like the Samaritans. Looked just like the Moabites. Looked just like the Philistines. Looked just like the Amorites. You couldn't tell a difference. Idolatry. They were separated from God. Can people tell a difference with us? Do they see it? Hopefully. Oh, well, yeah, hopefully, absolutely. So then Manasseh's son was Amon. So that's in 22.19. It says, Amon was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned for two years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the, in the Lord's sight, just as his father Manasseh had done. And there's so many lessons here, right, about the responsibility of fathers. And the children, sons will follow what their fathers do, be that good or be that evil. So there's, I mean, you go on and on. But then we're going to get to chapter 22, and we're going to get to this guy, Josiah. So, I'm just going to read, I'm going to glean through chapter 22 and pull some scriptures up. It says, Josiah was eight when he became king. So he was a little bitty boy when he became king. And typically, and it talks about his mother, they always talk about their mothers, because obviously he's king because of his, he's positionally king because of how he was born, right? The order of which he was born. But he's only eight years old, so he wasn't actually making directions. So somebody, most likely his mother, was behind him, bringing him up, trying to get him, basically a puppet, like certain other puppets. <laughs> so, then jump down to... Uh, Verse 2 says, He did what was right in the Lord's sight and walked in all the ways of his ancestor David. He did not turn to the left or to the right. This guy was, as a young guy, even at now eight, you don't know what he was like at eight, but as he's growing up, he is touched by God. Right? Mm -hmm. He is doing all the things. He's just like David. Do you remember David? David was the, he was the runt of the litter. Don't you remember that? David was a run. Remember when, when, when Samuel came to, 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 uh, to uh, what's David's father's name? Um, Jesse. Jesse's house. Yeah, he came to Jesse's house, right? Because God said the king's going to come out of Jesse's house. And he went and he had these big, tall, strapping, muscular guys. And he looks, he puts his hand over one of them. No. <laughs> puts his hand over one of them. No. I mean, all these studly men. And, you know, and, and, and Samuel's all confused. And he looks, he says, Jesse, you got any more boys? Well, I got the old run, David. He's out back with the sheep. Bring him in. Brought him in. He said, that's my man right there. That's him, right? He was touched by him. What did we learn about David? David was out there. You know, why, why wasn't David afraid of Goliath? He said, dude, I've, I've, I've killed bears and lions. 
What's that man going to do to me? Plus, you remember what he said? i got God on my side. If God's with me, I'm in. I'm in. So that's Josiah as a young guy. Right? Look what he said, because he even described it. how God describes it. He says, he did what was right in the Lord's sight and walked in all the ways of his ancestor David. Not in some of them, all of them. So what do we know about David? What do we know about Josiah? Josiah was a man after God's heart. Wasn't David what they called David? David was a man after God's heart. Had a great relationship. Now, look what happens. So, um, Josiah, he starts now in verse 3. It says, in the 18th year of King Josiah. So, at the 18th year, and he was 8 when he was done. So, now he's 26 years old. So, he reigned from 640. So, at 640, he was 8 years old. So, what we're going to do is we're going to take 16 years uh, from that. And so, he's going to be 26 years old. Getting his sea legs underneath him. And what's he do? He gets old enough. He gets established enough. And then he starts to make this decree. Look what he says. Verse 3. In the 18th year of King Josiah, the king sent the court secretary, and I'm going to skip all the names, go up to the high priest Hilkiah, so that he may total up the silver brought into the Lord's temple. And then he goes on and, and he says, uh, he wants to rebuild the temple. That's in this, in this decision. And I believe that that is right around the time that Zephaniah comes in and he's prophesying. Because what we're going to see is Zephaniah saying, change your ways, change your ways. That's why I believe, if you look at it, and I've studied it enough, I'm not saying it's perfect, but that he started, see, he was a prophet 635 to 625. Okay, so if you take the time frame of Josiah when he was when he was king at 640, but he's only eight years old, so he wasn't really doing anything, is that he was hearing, and we're going to talk about this when we get to Zephaniah. Zephaniah is the only prophet who had royal blood. You go to Zephaniah 1 1, and Zephaniah was a descendant of the king. So he was, and again, you've got to read in color. I believe he was in Josiah's court. I believe he had access to Josiah. He wasn't a commoner. Yeah, Isaiah, um, uh, you know, Habakkuk, all these other guys, they were commoners. <coughs> Zephaniah was not. He was royalty. And so when we look at that, I believe that he has, and again, this is just my opinion, but the timeline works. As Josiah's coming up as a king, trying to figure out how to lead. I'm a leader of the Israelites, or the, you know, the, the people of Judah. God's people. How do I lead? Zephaniah's coming along and saying, turn, turn. Get rid of all these idols. Turn. Get rid of all these idols. So go to Zephaniah 1. 1. Says the Lord of the Lord came to Zephaniah, son of Cushag, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a king. Hezekiah. I'm mean, sorry, Hezekiah. Sorry, Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the king before Manasseh. So he was descent. He was of royal blood. So I believe he was in the palace. He had access, and that his words were being heard by Josiah. Because look, Josiah does things that are so different than anybody else did. He starts to look at the temple and say, you know, we need to clean this place up. We need to get it built. It. So he tells, he goes, get, go get the high priest. Tell him get the silver. Pay the guys to fix this place. So then we're going to go to this back in uh, King Second Kings twenty two. So. Um, Go to verse 8. It says, The high priest Hilkiah told the court secretary, I have found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. Hmm. And he gave the book to Sepham who read it. Then the court secretary Sepham went to the king and reported, Your servants have emptied out the silver that was found in the temple and given it to those uh, doing the work, those who oversee the Lord's temple. Then the court secretary told the king, The priest Hilkiah has given me a book and he read the book in the presence of the king. The, the, the book. This one. Mm -hmm. The book. Mm -hmm. He read it. They found it. Right. They found the book. Which means what? They hadn't been reading the book. How were they to know what was going on? What God was supposed to do? Now, the timeline here is going to get to in a minute. So we're going to continue to read verse 11. It says, When the king, this is Josiah, okay, he's 26 years old. When the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. And remember, that was an outward sign of shame. Then he commanded the high priest Hilkiah um, and all these others, da, 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 go and inquire the Lord for me, the people in all Judah, about the words of this book that has been found. 
For great is the Lord's wrath that is kindled against us because our ancestors have not obeyed the words of the book in order to do everything written about us. Wow. I mean, this king, for the first time, and you think about it, he's 26 years old, he's been king since he was eight. Nobody ever said, you know, by the way, I, I think there's, some, there's a really important book that God gave our people that tells us how we're supposed to live, how we're supposed to act, all the things you've been studying in Leviticus about the feasts and the festivals, right? They're supposed to do those things, right? From the very beginning. Guess how long it's been since they did it? Guess. Eight. Long time. <laughs> 300 years. Wow. That book has been dusty. For 300. Years. Oh, yeah, look here. If you go over to, go to chapter 23, verse 21. The king commanded all the people, observe the Passover of the Lord your God is written in the book of the covenant. No such Passover had been observed from the time of the judges who judged Israel through the entire time of the kings of Israel and Judah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who's that primarily like wow. the first five books in the Yes. Yes, the first five. Yes, the Pentateuch. Yes, the first five books. So they hadn't observed the Passover. Do we realize the Passover is the most important? Sure. Right? The Passover symbolizes what Jesus did for us. Right? That's how that all works. 300 years. Here's a guy who's been king since he was 8 years old. He's 26. He doesn't even know the Word of God. Doesn't even know it. That's how far south they've gone. And what we have to do, I believe, is we have to look at this and say, that could happen to us. Why do we have churches, downtown churches in cities around this country, that have been converted to restaurants and bars and music venues. Why? Nobody was held accountable. Nobody, they stopped reading God's Word. They just disappeared. Just disappeared. Absolutely. So we continue to read. So the priest, they went up to this prophetess named Hulda. This is in verse 14. And they inquired of her. She must have had... You know, they knew she was a priestess, right? That's what it's called, a prophetess, sorry. And she said to them, this is what the Lord says. I am about, and here we go, this is, this is the jealousy part that we're going to see. What idolatry led to this jealousy of God. Look what she says. It says, this is what the Lord says. I am about to bring disaster on this place and on its inhabitants, fulfilling all the words of the book that the king of Judah has read. Now here's why because they have abandoned me and burned incense to other gods in order to anger me with all the work of their hands. My wrath will be kindled against this place and it will not be quenched. Will not be quenched. Mm. Say this to the king of Judah who sent you to inquire. This is what the Lord God says. As for the words you heard, because... And this now. So that's the prophetess is saying what's going to happen overall big picture. All right? But now we're going to see that Josiah was a man after God's own heart because look what God does. All the wrath that's coming, he sees what... And in verse 23, we'll, we'll see all the changes that Josiah affected. But here's what he says. Now this is going, again, this is the prophetess telling the, telling the, the high priest Hilkiah, go and tell Josiah himself specifically this. Um, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse because you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I myself have heard. This is the Lord's declaration. Therefore, I will indeed gather you and your fathers and you will be gathered to your grave in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster that I am bringing on this place. And they reported it to the king. So what the Lord said to Josiah was, because of your heart, your heart for seeking me, right? This desolation is going to happen, but I'm going to bring you home before that. Because I don't want you to have to endure it, <clears throat> to see it. Because he turned. It's interesting. And you see that, you see that in verse, uh, uh, verse 17, the idolatry. Why is he doing this? Why is he going to bring this disaster? Because they have abandoned me and burned incense to other gods in order to anger me. They were worshiping idols. And I, I, I won't say we, me. I, I tend to think, when I think of worshiping idols, right, I think of idols. I think of, you know, like a Stand thing you set down and you're bowing down to it, right? But remember, an idol is anything that takes the place of God in our lives. 
anything. It doesn't. So we continue to read about how far down these people went. We go to verse 23, so or chapter 23. So what Josiah has done is he's heard these words from, from the prophets. He's read the book. He's reading the book. He's going to read the book to the people. He's going to tell them we've got to change, and he's going to implement serious change, but it's not enough to change God's wrath because God, God has set his mind that he said, I've asked again and again and again and again. So destruction is coming. But, and what we're going to see in the book of Zephaniah is I want you to look beyond the destruction at the redeeming quality that I'm going to bring back. Because what does he do? He brings back. We know at the end of Babylonian captivity, what did they do? Ezra and Nehemiah, they brought it back. They rebuilt the temple. They rebuilt Jerusalem. Because remember, God, in order to be with the people, had to have the temple. God dwelled in the temple in those days. No temple, no sacrifice. No temple, no place for God to reside in their lives. They had to clean the mess up out of the temple. And so what I want to challenge us with as we go into chapter 23 today, and we, we're going to read through the bulk of it in pieces, um, is that we look at that and look at it as a mirror to our own lives that says, what's my Asherah? What idol have I set up in my house and outside of my house that I need to deal with? Because that's what he's talking about here. So verse, or chapter 23. So the king sent messengers, and they gathered all the elders of Judah. In Jerusalem they brought to him. When the king went to the Lord's temple with all the men of Judah and the inhabitants, as well as the priests and the prophets, from the youngest to the oldest, here's what he did. So he brought all the leaders in, right, brought the people in, and he read in their hearing, he read to them, this, uh, all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. Next the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant in the Lord's presence, to follow the Lord and to keep His commands, His decrees, His statutes with all His heart, with all His soul, in order to carry out the words of this covenant that were written in the book, and all the people agreed to the covenant. Do we remember what, remember 1 John, what we learned in 1 John? We had three, uh, three things you can do to evaluate yourself, to, to see if you're saved. Number one was obedience. To God's word or ordinance. Right? You see, that was one of the first tests to know if you're saved. Right? Well, look what, look what he's saying there. He says, I want you to do what? I want you to make a covenant to do what? To follow the Lord, to keep his commands, his decrees, and his statutes. It hasn't changed. That's what he's asking us to do. The obedience to God's word. Remember, the, the, the second one was love of the brethren. And the third one was doctrine. But who Jesus is. Doctrine of Jesus. Alright. So, but the first one had changed. So what we have to do is we, look, we go back and we look at 1 John in the New Testament and we go back to, to 2 Kings and we look at that and what were they saying? It is important that we need to make a covenant to keep the ordinances, the commands, and the decrees, and the statutes. Isn't that what we said at salvation? Isn't that what we symbolized at Baptism, the old's dead. I'm not following Raymond anymore. I'm following the Lord. I'm going to seek to be obedient. And when we're not, he gets jealous. Because his eyes, he says, your eyes are off me. Look at it simplistically. Look at it simplistically. Boil it down to really simple. Do you want your spouse staring at another person? Huh? I mean, what, you're ogling at another person? Would you get jealous? Absolutely. So does God. When we stare at idols and we think, boy, that idol could please me. That's what I need right there. So look what, look what the people did. Josiah implemented reforms. And I'm just going to blow through a lot of these in verse 4. He said, bring out the Lord. <laughs> Listen to how bad it was. To bring out of the Lord's sanctuary or out of the temple all the articles made for Baal, Asherah, and all the stars in the sky. In the temple were idols to Baal, Asherah, and the stars inside the temple. That would be like we had a, we got the devil worship section over in, on the left hand side of the sanctuary. <laughs> right, absolutely. I mean, it's it, it, it's a simple example, but it's the truth. And look what he said. And he took them out to to Jerusalem to the fields of Kidron, and he burned them. Good. He didn't just throw them out. He burned them. He destroyed them because he didn't want anybody to pick him pick them up. Mm -hmm. 
and use them. That's exactly what I meant. They didn't want to do that. Um, then he did away with the idolatrous priests that the kings of Judah had appointed to burn incense in the high places of the cities of Judah and the surrounding areas. They had burned incense to Baal, to the sun, to the moon, to the constellations, and all the stars in the sky. He brought out the Asherah pole, which was a, a pole that they prayed to, um, a pole to the god of Asherah, uh, from the Lord's temple. All this stuff was in the Lord's temple. So, let me ask you a question. What's the temple today? Church. No, us. We're the temple. We're the temple. The body is the church. We're the temple. So what we do is we look at this and say, what do I need to haul out and burn? What do I need to haul out and burn? What am I, what am I putting my faith, my trust in outside of God? Like Jay said, I mean, perfect example. Perfect example. You love my kids more than I do. You're in charge. I'll rest easy knowing you're in charge. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's what this is all about, people. Uh, he brought out the Asherah pole from the temple. He also tore down the houses of the male cult prostitutes that were in the Lord's temple. Right. Okay. Houses of prostitutes in the temple. Then Josiah brought the priests from the cities of Judah and he defiled the high places of Geba and Beersheba. He tore down the high places of the city gates at the entrance to the gate of the, where they had. When you walked into the gates of Jerusalem, they had the Moabite gods there. Remember what I said? You could travel all to the surrounding areas. They didn't look any different. They didn't look any different. Israel looked no different than any of their pagan neighbors. He defiled Topheth. Uh, so that no one could... This is gross. He defiled Topath so that no one could sacrifice his son or daughter in the fire to Moloch. You know what that was? You ever seen a, you ever seen a, a, a cane pot <clears throat> that, you, that you boil down sugar cane in? Like by the Bay Route, big giant steel pot. They would take those pots, cauldron, and they would heat them up till they were red hot. And they would take their children and throw them in. Because that's what they did to the god Molech. God's people were throwing their children as child sacrifices to be burned alive. No different than what we're doing today. That's right. That's right, Randy. This is right. That's exactly right. He got away, he got, he got rid of those. He, burned the, he killed the horses. He burned the chariots that were meant for sacrificing to the kings. He tore down the altars of the kings that Judah had made on the rooftops. The altars that Manasseh, his grandfather, had made in the courtyards of the Lord's temple. You see, what the, I mean, you see how bad these people were? Mm -hmm. um, and, and remember Solomon. If you remember Solomon, King Solomon, what was King Solomon's downfall? Anybody remember? Girls. Girls. Foreigners. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, but what, 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 what did he say? It, it, it was foreign women that he married, which was exactly what God said not to do when you went into the promised land. And so it drug him down. So listen, listen to what else Josiah tore down. This is verse 13. The king also defiled the high places that were across from Jerusalem, the mount across from Jerusalem, right, to the south of the mount of destruction. Here, why? Listen to this. Which King Solomon of Israel had built Ashtoreth, the abhorrent idol to the Sidonians, for Chemosh, and the uh, abhorrent idol of Moab, and for Milcom, the detestable idol of the Amorites. Because of Solomon did. Solomon, because of the influence of foreign women that he was forbidden to marry, and he did anyway, he literally went on the mount, which is across from the Temple Mount, and built <clears throat> four idols for, their, for those people to come and worship there. He built those. Um, he even tore down the altar and the high place that had been made by Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, who caused Israel to sin. He sent someone to take the bones out of the tombs and he burned the bones on the altars. Mm. Verse 19, Josiah removed all the shrines of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria. Remember, Samarians were half-breeds. Which the kings of Israel had made, listen to this, 
the kings of Israel made shrines in the high places of Samaria in order to anger the Lord. They did a good job at that. He slaughtered the altars of the priests in the high places and he burned human bones on the altars. Then he returned to Jerusalem. In other words, he went out and then what we're going to see next is he came back to Jerusalem and then he commanded the people, this is verse 21. He said, observe the Passover of the Lord your God is written in the book of the covenant. No such Passover has been observed from the time of the judges who judged Israel through the time of the kings of Israel and Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, the Lord's Passover was observed in Jerusalem. So, the 18th year, so in one year, what Josiah did was he went out and he cleaned house. He started by cleaning up the temple. And then he cleaned up everything around. So, what I would infer to you is that when we begin to allow the idols of the world to distract us from our first love, which should be the Lord, then we've got to start by cleansing the temple. And how do we cleanse the temple? By confession and repentance. Conf that's all he's doing right here. He's cleaning up the mess. You know what? I'm not playing with that stuff anymore. I'm not messing with that. I'm going to tear down those. So when we study this, you say, wow, wait a minute, who cares about all this history? I do. Because what it shows me is that if I'm not accountable to people in my life, to brothers and sisters that are, that are Christians in my life, then I will have a temple full of idols. i got to do it. So we got to clean up. He goes on. Further zeal for the Lord. This is 22 verse 24. In addition, this is obedience. In addition, Josiah eradicated the mediums, the spirits, spiritists, household idols, images, and all the abhorrent things that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem. He did this in order to carry out the words of the law which were written in the book that the high priest Hilkiah found in the Lord's temple. Before him, and this is a this is a, speaking about Josiah, uh, says, before him, before Josiah, there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and all his soul and all his strength according to all the law of Moses and no one like him arose after him. He was a rock star. Right. But you know what? He was just a man. He was just a man. And he was a man who, who yielded to the Lord and said, Lord, use me. And I'm going to clean this place up. And he did. And then he goes on to say, in spite of all that, now here's, here's the jealousy of God. Because once God sets his jaw on this, right? He said, in spite of all that, the Lord did not turn from the fury of his intense burning anger which burned against Judah, Judah because of all the affronts to which Manasseh had angered him. For the Lord said, I will also remove Judah from my presence just as I removed Israel. And I will reject this city, Jerusalem, that I have chosen and the temple about which I said, my name will be there. This is God's dwelling place with His people. And He chooses to destroy it. And he's not dwelling with them. When he does, he left them. He lets it go. Go do that. Go yourself. So, um, we will leave it there. And we'll come back next week and we'll start looking within. But I challenge you to go, go to Second Chronicles and read the, the mirroring verses. Read through this stuff, what's going on. Start looking at Zephaniah. A little confusing uh, because it's, 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 it's kind of poetic at times. Um, but what we want to do is, I just, I, I just want this to be, and, I, and maybe, you know, un unfortunately, you get, you get what God <laughs> is trying to tell me. And, and when we came to 521 last week and I started studying it, and then I came to Zephaniah, and, and I started looking, well, why did Zephaniah prophesy? Because of the idolatry. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. Last week I'm studying idolatry. Now I'm starting to study and I'm seeing idolatry. And it really pushed me to say, what, what things do I have in my temple that I need to clean out so that I can then perform the Passover meal? Right? Passover is remembrance. 
It's remembering what he's done for it. In other words, and remember what, what, what I think the Second Corinthians says, talks about don't come take the Lord's the Lord's Supper until you do. If you got something against your brother, just say take the supper. No, it says go straighten things out with your brother, then come back. Otherwise, it's, you, so it's kind of that same way. You see, that's how that was. He had to clean the temple. He had to cleanse the people before they could do Passover. So we're coming into the Easter season, right? Which is our Passover remembrance. It's the same time Passover is Easter is our Passover. So as we're coming into that, I realize it's still a couple months out. But we need to think about it. We don't want to go into that season with a bunch of filth in us. We need to think about it. And we need to think, where am I using idols in my life that are taking a place where I think God can't fulfill? That's what it really says. God, I don't think you can do this. You can't bring this joy to me, so i got something else that I think can bring you, me the joy that you can't bring me. It's a pretty bold thing to say to God. Mm -hmm. Amen? Next thing.